This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace to you and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Warminster. And a special welcome to those who worship with us through WRDB FM radio. Today's flowers are dedicated to the glory of God by Nancy in memory of her husband John's birthday and by Sue and Faye in honor of grandson and great-grandson Jamie on his second birthday. Our prayer requests for this week are for Cindy B, who has informed us that her mother suffered a stroke in Florida and has recently been taken off life support. Also, the Dermaphsesian and Pollock families ask our prayers for Peg as she continues to receive hospice care. And for Kathy S., recently discharged from the hospital to receive physical therapy before she returns home. Today's liturgist is Jenny, and our musical gifts are offered by Kathy worth Balkus on organ and piano, and our special music is offered by Jonna Iser, a soloist, and Sue Murphy, a sign language interpreter. Worship now begins with the sounding of the chimes. Let us worship the one who calls us, who leads us to compassion and draws us nearer to justice. Let us worship the one who creates us, who forms and reforms us in the image of our maker. Worship continues with the prelude.
Before turning to scripture, let us pray. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid. Of them for I am with you to deliver you says the Lord then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth and the Lord said to me now I have put my words in your mouth see today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down to destroy and to overthrow to build and to plant Psalm 71 1 through 6 in you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Hebrews 12, 18 through 29. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them for they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship, with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. And our gospel lesson is from the 13th chapter of Luke, verses 10 through 17. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath 
untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. Those are the words spoken by the Lord when he delivers the Ten Commandments to Moses at Mount Sinai. And it's the command Jesus is accused of violating when he heals a woman on the Sabbath. Scripture tells us that consecrating the Sabbath is central to our identity because it's how we reflect that we are made in the image of God. Observing a holy Sabbath is about remembering that because God rested after creating a world abundant in life and blessing, we can rest from our labors because we know that the earth will keep turning without our help, that the sun will rise and set without our having to accomplish anything during the daylight, and that the hours of each day and the months of each year will pass at the same pace, regardless of how much we use or waste our time. And especially for us church folk, Sabbath rest reminds us that the fruits of discipleship are not of our own making. They don't depend ultimately on our hard work, but on the Lord's grace, the Lord's nurture, and the Lord's faithfulness. And so the command to rest on the Sabbath has nothing to do with taking a day off to recharge our batteries so we can plunge back into our busy lives and wear ourselves out again. Sabbath keeping has to do with cultivating a constant attentiveness to the one who truly sustains us, not just one day each week, but every moment of every day. Now, if your upbringing was like mine, you and your family kept a holy Sabbath by going to church on Sunday mornings and staying home for the rest of the day, not doing much of anything, unless, of course, you grew up in a tradition where you went back to church on Sunday night. But not for me. After the big Sunday lunch, it was downhill from there. And we did very little because most temptation to do anything at all had been removed. Stores were closed. Television programming was bland. And no one would ever have dared to imagine scheduling a Little League baseball game or a soccer match. And it was that way for a long time in American culture. As long ago as the mid-1800s, a famous French political thinker toured the United States and wrote about our democracy and our culture. And he wrote this about how Christians observed the Sabbath back then. He wrote, not only have all ceased to work, but they appear to have ceased to exist. Well, that's not what Sabbath keeping is about. In fact, it's about the opposite. Sabbath is the time to celebrate existence. It's the time to honor life in all its forms and not just human life. Just as God rested from work 
of creating the universe to delight in its beauty and its bounty, so must we. We must stop and look up from our work and our burdens, or we will forget that our lives are not of our own making and manipulation. And neither are the lives of others. We all belong completely to our sovereign God. So Sabbath keeping isn't a form of personal piety. It's supposed to have a social and communal aspect as well. The rest of the commandment that God gives to Moses about the Sabbath says this, you shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, or your livestock or the resident alien in your towns. In other words, Sabbath keeping means that no one truly rests unless everyone rests. But there are other reasons for the Sabbath command. An important one that we're less familiar with because it isn't found in Exodus where we usually read the Ten Commandments, but in the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses re-delivers the commandments to a new generation of Israelites just before they enter the promised land. And the reason given there for keeping the Sabbath is to remember how they were once slaves in Egypt, set free from their bondage, not by Pharaoh, not by Moses, not by themselves, but by their God. To rest from labor on the Sabbath is to remember, to reenact even, how their identity no longer is defined by being controlled or coerced by any human power, but by their freedom to live under no one's dominion but God's. And that from here on out, they are commanded to treat others with the same liberating compassion that God has treated them by releasing from bondage anyone among them whose lives are burdened by oppression, by debt, by hunger, by poverty, or by injustice. And so Sabbath keeping fundamentally is about freedom and how no one truly enjoys freedom unless everyone is free. So observing a holy Sabbath is about much more than just how to live one day out of the week. It's about how to live all our days with constant communion with God, our creator, and with constant compassion and justice toward our neighbors. And that's what Jesus is doing when he heals the woman who enters the synagogue, bent double from her affliction. I can't help but think that he appeals to the Sabbath practice of releasing oxen and donkeys from their mangers and leading them to water to relieve their burden. Because this woman's posture resembles that of an overworked farm animal, burdened to the point of deformity by her condition for so long that no one notices anymore. No one feels any urgency for her to be healed and set free when she comes into Jesus's presence. Not even the woman herself feels the need to be healed. And it's no coincidence that this story is immediately followed by Jesus telling us what the kingdom of God looks like. It's as though healing this woman paints a picture of what the coming of God's ultimate reign will look like for us. It will look like the rest 
and freedom that God intends for the entire creation, where no one is overwrought by sin or overburdened by toil and suffering, but where everyone is free to live as God created them. And the way Jesus takes the initiative to heal this woman reminds us that God's kingdom isn't completely beyond this world because in Jesus Christ, the kingdom came to us, inviting us to take part in it now by how we live our lives and by relieving the burdens of others as we let go of our own. Because no one truly is at rest until everyone's burdens are lifted. No one is free unless all are free. So let us remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, to God be all power and glory and dominion now and forever. Amen. Amen. With believing hearts, as the children of God, let us turn to the Lord with our prayers. Let us pray. Holy God, you have set us apart to carry your promises into the world. 
Our labor for your kingdom always begins with praising you and praying for others. So we pray for all people, Lord Jesus, that our divisions may cease and that all may be one as you and the Father are one. We pray for the mission of your church, that in faithful witness, we may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray for those who do not yet believe and for those who have lost their faith, that may they receive the light of your good news. We pray to you, O oh Lord, for the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. We pray to you, O Lord, for the poor, the persecuted, the imprisoned, the sick, and all who suffer and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected by your grace. We pray to you, O Lord, for our enemies and for all whom we have injured or offended. And we pray for ourselves, for the forgiveness of our sins, and for the grace of the Holy Spirit to amend and reform our lives for our families, friends, and neighbors. That being freed from anxiety, we may live in joy, peace, and health. As we lift up to you our prayers for Cindy's mother, for Peg and the Dermophsesian and Pollock families, and for Kathy as she regains her strength. Oh God, you promised to bless all the families of the earth through us, your people. Pour out your spirit on the whole creation. Bring the nations of the world into your fellowship and hasten the day when your kingdom will come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forget our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now in peace, let us go out into the world to love and serve our Lord and to love and serve our neighbors. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. Amen.